Well, go ahead and open your Bible with me to Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. And this is what I've decided to do, being that I just took over as the senior pastor. For the next four weeks, I thought I would tell a fun story about myself so you guys could get to know me a little bit better. And then I would encourage you to send in a picture of yourself with a fun story about you so I can start memorizing people's faces and names. How does that sound? So write it down right now, admin at acfweb.org, admin at acfweb.org. Take a picture of you, your spouse, your family, send me a picture, send me a fun story about you guys. Embarrassing, you know, embarrassing stories are even better if you want to do that. I'm starting with an embarrassing story. This is a family favorite. My mom's already starting to smile. My mom's here today. And, uh, I grew up in a large family. I had seven brothers or six brothers and sisters. There's seven of us total. And five of them were brothers. So you can imagine there was a lot of fierce competition for image and ego. And I was in the top three, so I had to look cool at all times. Couldn't be challenged by the lower ones. If they sensed fear, they would be on you like piranhas. It was just, it was unheard of. I'm lucky to be alive today. So... My mom asked me if I would go down and feed our dog. And we have this L-shaped wood staircase that goes down two flights to our basement. And she was like, would you feed Max? Max is our 120-pound obese Labrador. Has anybody else ever had a huge Labrador? Yeah? I tell some people, they go, 120 pounds? I can't. He was huge, okay? And he could eat a ton. Like that bowl was like, you know, half my body weight. Okay, maybe that's exaggerated, but I'm going down the stairs and it just happens to be that today's like a wet food meal. It's not just like normal dry food. And uh, the staircase is old, it's wood, it's painted, so it gets a little slick. And as I'm going down the staircase holding this bowl of food, I literally just slip. I'm probably like 12 maybe. Mom says I was around 12. And uh, my feet just kick off from underneath me and I land on my back and I just go sliding down the staircase. All right, it was like something out of a comic. And I kid you not, I'm like going down the staircase looking up and I see the bowl of dog food like flipping in the air above me. But like nothing's coming out. It's just flipping. And then I get to the middle flight and I stop and I look up and it flips upside down and just comes square down over my face. And my family is at the top of the staircase just howling with laughter. And you know what? That story, I've never lived it down. I'll always be dog food Cody, so... I'm just, I'm just kidding. They don't call me that. <laughs> now they do. But it's Pastor Dog Food Cody to you guys. So, <laughs> Oh, man, I'm kidding. All right, open your Bible with me to Mark chapter 3. Something else that's new and fun is, uh, you know, I've had so much fun being challenged trying to teach the house church messages in 20 minutes. And what it does is it really forces you to have to understand the text better so that you can communicate it the most effectively and efficiently as you can. And uh, I know for me, my, my attention span is 30 minutes. Anybody else here, their attention span? A few of you? Okay, the rest of you guys are really great, mature Christians, and that's awesome. Um, some of us, though, are still trying to grow in our attention span. We're very extroverted. And so I decided that I'm going to try and teach in 30-minute segments for you guys on Sunday mornings. Maybe it doesn't work. Maybe it does work. I know it's unheard of. Most pastors preach for 45 to 50. So I've set a timer today. And if you hear the timer go off, that's what it is, okay? And uh, I'll call the worship team up and I'll try not to leave us hanging because today we're talking about the unforgivable sin. Now, you can say thank you to Pastor Mark. He left us with that text this morning. And he's sitting on the beach in Hawaii right now laughing about me teaching this text, I guarantee it. So Lord, would you meet us this morning as we just dive into Lord, this well-known and probably well misunderstood text. And Lord, it's caused so much torment and so much anxiety in the body of Christ. And Lord, it's brought so much division on doctrine. And God, I pray this morning, you would just help us to understand your heart. And God, the things that we can't understand, I pray that we would just trust it to you. Lord, I pray that you would touch our hearts deeply today, God, that your, root, your word would sink in and take root in us, Lord. God, and produce fruit in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's read through our text this morning, picking up in verse 20 of chapter 3. We'll read to the bottom of the chapter and then we'll come back. Then the multitude came together again so that they could not so much as eat bread. But when his own people heard about this, they went out to lay hold of him, for they said, He is out of his mind. 
And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, he has Beelzebub. And by the ruler of demons, he casts out demons. So that he called them to himself and said to them in parables, how can Satan cast out Satan? <clears throat> if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand but has an end. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house. Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men and whatever blasphemies they may utter. But he who blasphemies against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation. Because they said to him, he has an unclean spirit. Then his brothers and his mother came and standing outside, they sent to him, calling him. And a multitude was sitting around him. They said to him, look, your, your mother and your brothers are outside looking or seeking you. But he answered them saying, who is my mother or my brothers? And he looked around the circle at those who sat by him. And he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. <clears throat> what a fun text for us this morning. Let's pick back up in verse 20. Then the multitude came together again so that they could not so much as eat bread. Now the context to our text today actually comes from a few verses earlier. You guys remember last week that Pastor Mark preached about how Jesus went up on the mountain and he was praying and he was seeking the Lord and, and he called out 12 disciples. But if you go back just a little bit before that, you would know that Jesus had been going around the Sea of Galilee and he had been preaching the word. And verse seven says, a great multitude from Galilee followed him from Judea and Jerusalem and Idumea and beyond the Jordan and those from Tyre and Sidon, a great multitude when they heard how many things he was doing came to his disciples. In fact, there were so many people around Jesus that verse nine says, so he told his disciples that a small boat should be kept ready for him because of the multitude, lest they should crush him. Can you imagine that? So many people pressing against Jesus, wanting to touch Jesus and be touched by Jesus, that he had to keep a small boat for himself so he wouldn't get crushed by them. That's a crazy scene. And so Jesus had gone up on the mountain and he'd come back down and he had his 12 disciples and this huge multitude that's been following him has now gathered outside the house he's staying in. Can you imagine if there was like thousands of people packed into your neighborhood? Like it was a football game all surrounding your little house. Imagine what your yard would look like afterwards. Just totally trampled. And I imagine it must have been overwhelming for these small towns to have that big of a crowd just packed in the highways and the byways and the alleys and everyone's there to see Jesus. In fact, some of the people had gotten into the house and there were so many people, they don't even have time to eat bread. They're just ministering to the needs of people. And I think about Jesus. I think about the pressure he must have faced. Can you imagine if you had thousands of people watching you, wanting to touch you and talk with you, wanting you to serve them? But you know what? What touches my heart the most is Jesus never viewed people as an inconvenience. He never viewed them as a burden. I've been convicted by this as I've been studying. Jesus was busy. There's no doubt about that. He was always about the Father's work but Jesus was tangible. In fact, probably one of the things that you and I love the most about our Lord is how available he is. Don't you guys love that about Jesus? That at any moment you can turn and just say, Lord, I need you and he's right there. And I believe that that's the way Jesus lived his earthly life as well. He was available to people. In fact, one of my favorite stories is Jesus on the way to the cross. And the crowd is following him. He's going to Jerusalem and he knows he's going to die. He's told his disciples, I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be uh, crucified. And he's walking there and there's blind Bartimaeus along the road. Do you guys know the story? And blind Bartimaeus is crying out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. 
And here is Jesus going to this most intense, agonizing stage of his life. And yet the kind of the pinnacle of his mission. And the crowd actually tells the blind man to be quiet. Stop shouting. Don't bother Jesus. He doesn't have time for you. And yet Jesus, when he's walking, he hears this one man's cry. It said that he stopped and he said, bring him to me. And they brought Bartimaeus to him. Jesus healed his sight. And that man was forever changed. And I remember Chuck Smith teaching that. And he said, if ever my ministry is bigger than one man's need, then my ministry is bigger than my Lord's. Guys, I'm convicted by this because the reason I think people were not an inconvenience to Jesus is because saving and serving people was Jesus's mission. That was his mission, to serve people, to reveal God to people, to save people. That's what Jesus was about. That's why he's hanging on the cross and he's going through this incredible work of salvation for us, giving his soul as an offering. And yet the thief on the cross next to him looks over and says, Lord, remember me in paradise. And Jesus stops and says, today you're gonna be with me. And he's saving that man right there as he's on the cross. It's the heart of Jesus. And yet I wonder why you and I struggle so much with ministering to people. And as I wrestled with it, I think I came to the conclusion that for the modern church, serving people isn't really our mission. I mean, as a mission statement, yes, of course, we all believe in the Great Commission. But on an individual level, so many of us have a different mission to our life, if we're honest. I'm trying to pursue higher education. I'm trying to be the best athlete. I'm trying to get that promotion at my work. And I'm trying to, you know, do this in my job. I'm trying to build this life for my family. And I was convicted. Because when people are an inconvenience to you and I, it's just a reminder that we're living for the wrong things. I'm not saying God doesn't call people to be doctors. He does. But he calls people to be doctors who are ministering to people. Whatever your occupation is, the Lord has given that to you, but it's so that you can better minister to those around you. That's the mission. And I love that about Paul. Paul is one of the greatest missionaries in the Bible. It's because he lived with that mentality everywhere he was. If I'm a prisoner, I'm the Lord's prisoner. These people are chained to me. I'm here to minister to them. If he was making tents to make a little money for his trips, he was ministering to the tent makers around him. He was traveling. He saw a young man who had some faith along the way. And he said, come on, Timothy, come with me. And you and I are to have the mission of our Lord. In fact, that's the mission we feel God has called our church to, to see people get saved and brought into the family of Christ, to see people surrounded in community and fellowship, to see people raised up to serve and be a part of the great commission. And then to see people sent out to wherever the Lord would call them but it's a personal mission that you and I need to live out every day. I was convicted by that, that one little verse right there at the beginning. Well, Jesus is so busy that he hasn't even had time to eat. And so I love this one, verse 21. But when his own people heard about this, and that's referring to his family, when Jesus's family gets word like, hey, you know, because they don't have like the internet or cell phones. Probably somebody came from one of Jesus's teachings and like, oh, we saw Jesus. And they're like, how is my boy? And they're like, man, he's crazy. He's got people, thousands of people all over him. He hardly ever eating. He's losing weight. And you can just imagine Mary and her mother's heart and Jesus' brothers who are very skeptical of him. were like, what is he doing? We have to go get him. Look what it says. They went out to lay hold of him for they said, he is out of his mind. <laughs> what is Jesus doing? And we'll get to the more of that in a second. So Jesus is ministering to the people and the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, he has Beelzebub. So this is interesting. You got two groups coming. You have Jesus' family who are coming to get Jesus because they're like, he's out of his mind. And then you have the scribes who are probably an official delegation from the Sanhedrin, which was like the Jewish Supreme Court, coming down to observe Jesus and see if he was authentic or see if he was um, an apostate teacher. They've come to examine him. And so you have these two different groups coming. And you know, the scribes look at the power of Jesus and they say, 
he has Beelzebub, and by the ruler of demons, he casts out demons. Now, we know from earlier in Mark that the scribes and the religious leaders had already decided, determined together to find a way to destroy Jesus. So no doubt this was a part of it. They're trying to thwart the work of God. They're trying to thwart Jesus' ministry, so they need to discredit him in the people's eyes. But you know, I was struck by something else. I think one of the reasons Jesus' family wrestled with what he was doing And one of the reasons the scribes wrestled with what Jesus was doing is because Jesus was doing something that was beyond human capacity. Have you guys ever thought of that? I mean, the way he was serving people was beyond human capacity. His compassion, his love, his ministering, his doctrine, his teaching was beyond human capacity his supernatural ability. Jesus had been healing the sick, giving sight to the blind, casting out demons in his own authority, making the paralytic walk and forgiving people of their sin. Jesus was doing something that only God could do. And I think the common problem that Jesus's family and these scribes had is they couldn't bring themselves to believe the obvious. His brothers looked at what he was doing and they said, it's beyond human understanding what he's teaching, what he's doing. So he has to be out of his mind. The scribes looked at Jesus and they said, he's doing what only we thought the supernatural was capable of. But instead of saying he must be God, they said, well, he must be Satan. And by the ruler of demons, clear reference to Satan, he casts out demons. Guys, this was convicting to me because have you ever talked with someone that's told you, well, if I, was, if I had seen Jesus do miracles firsthand, then I would believe in Jesus. Have you ever seen that? Read that? Heard someone say that to you? Probably a lot of us have. Maybe you've actually wondered that in your heart. But you know, the reality of that isn't true. You had people right here witnessing the work of God. Witnessing a man do what only God could do. And even though they saw it with their own eyes, they couldn't choose to believe. And maybe you're here and you've been wrestling with that. And I would just let you know that sometimes unbelief isn't an evidence issue. It's often a heart issue. They chose not to believe they wouldn't believe. They would rather accuse Jesus of being empowered by Satan than to submit to Jesus as Lord. And that's a heart condition. You know, I'm convicted about this because there's so much evidence that was right in front of them that they were unwilling to receive. You know, my heart has been stirred as I've been preparing for this message. There's so much evidence for Jesus that's still in front of people today. Did you know that there is more substantial and accurate historical writings about Jesus than there are for Julius Caesar? And we commonly accept Julius Caesar as an emperor. We commonly accept Alexander the Great having died at 33. But did you know that there's more evidence for Jesus' resurrection alone than for both of those guys' events? That's amazing. You know, I was just reading something the other day. It was a chat room and people were talking. I saw people talking about Jesus and they're talking about, well, you know, you can't go back in time to know if Jesus' miracles were even real. So you can't really believe the man. And yet actually, if you studied it, you would know that there are ancient writings and some of them by Jewish historians where they argue and discuss the source of Jesus's miraculous power. You find that in that day, there was no question about Jesus doing miracles. They were just questioning how he was doing it. In fact, if you studied it, you would know that the argument really isn't, was Jesus a real person? That's not what people 
are really arguing and wrestling with because there's more than enough evidence for the life, the work, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What people are actually wrestling with is, is Jesus Lord and will I submit to him? That's the truth. And though they would accuse Jesus of being Satan, the evidence would beg to differ. And I would just wonder if there's anyone here today, maybe you're in the same boat as these scribes, and I would ask you, what's your excuse? And if you're honest with yourself, could you see that it's a heart issue, not an evidence issue? The fact alone that Jesus changes millions of people's lives, even to this day, he's changing people is evidence enough that there's something real and tangible about this person. You know, C.S. Lewis was so stirred by it that he said Jesus could only be three things logically. He could either be a liar, it could all be made up, and he could be the power of Satan, which is what the scribe said. He could be a lunatic and just be a crazy man, or he could be everything that he said he was, and he could be Lord. And logically, if you think through it and you read the text and you study, you come to realize he could only be everything he said he is. The son of the living God. So I love Jesus' response to these guys. It's incredibly logical. When Jesus heard it, he said to them, oh, sorry, I was reading the wrong verse. So he called them to himself, verse 23, and said to them in parables, how can Satan cast out Satan? Jesus is going to use a very logical argument. If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand but has an end. And you know what I love about the Christian faith? is It's actually incredibly logical. It's an incredibly logical faith when you get into it. It makes sense. If you don't believe me, you should go read the book of Romans. My theology teacher told me it's logic on fire. In fact, if uh, you guys want to read a good book, we're doing Mere Christianity on our podcast right now. It's our book cover. And it's a logical argument for the Christian God. And it is powerful. You should read it. It's a mesmerizing little book by C.S. Lewis, the Mere Christianity. And you know, but I love what David Guzik says that our faith isn't just logical. It actually goes beyond logic. Because our faith goes beyond human logic and it fully rests on God's logic. I think of the story of Noah. They had never seen rain. Goes beyond human logic, but Noah trusted God. And God said, Noah, I want you to do something that doesn't make sense to you right now. Looking back on the account of the flood, we go, that was the most logical thing you could do was build a boat, right? I mean, if the world's gonna get flooded, you would think a boat is what you need but they had never seen water and they didn't even know what a boat was. And yet Noah by faith stepped out and it turned out to be for his deliverance. And so our faith goes beyond human logic because it rests on God's. But this is what Jesus says to them now. He said, no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house. So Jesus is doing the works of God. He's touching people right in front of them and changing them and changing their, their life and just radically healing people. And they, they're calling it the work of Satan. And Jesus says, how could it be Satan? Do you guys know that the work of Satan is to enslave people? That's the work of Satan. You may not believe that, but that's the work of Satan. He wants to bring people into bondage. That's what he does. He's the thief who's come to kill, steal, and destroy, Jesus said. He's been a murderer from the start. And so Jesus says, how can I be Satan if I'm setting people free from Satan? If Satan's whole MO is to take people captive, then why would he ever turn them loose? And then he makes a great point. He says, what kingdom or nation would ever stand if it was at civil war? Satan is way too efficient, way too organized to be that dumb. The day he starts to fight among himself is the day he's going to lose. Guys, and I actually think for you and I, there's a really practical application there. What church can stand that's divided? You know, division is the work of Satan. Did you know that? In God's people, the Bible makes it clear, God hates division. And one of the things that God hates is someone who is divisive. Someone who sows discord among brethren. 
And it's just a good reminder for you and I. Because hey, we, we all have emotions and feelings and passions and opinions and political differences. But I need to be aware that I'm not gonna be used as a vessel of Satan to bring disunity into God's church. In fact, God was so serious about his people not being divisive that Paul wrote in his letter to Titus. He said, a re, in a divisive man, you should rebuke him once, maybe twice, but even after the first rebuke, you should throw him out because there's no room for division in the body of Christ. In fact, Paul would write in Ephesians that you and I are to endeavor to keep that unity in the spirit through the bond of peace. You and I should be thinking to ourselves, what builds up the body of Christ? What promotes the peace of God in the body of Christ? Not what tears it down. Not what divides. You know, and it's okay. One thing I love about our church is we have people from all sorts of different backgrounds and cultures and opinions. And yet Paul makes a strong argument that all that you and I have together in the Lord is enough that we should be united. What we have together in Jesus is more than what we don't have together. That's Paul's argument. You have one Lord, one salvation, one baptism, one hope, one faith, one spirit. All these things that you and I have in common that we're to base our unity on. So I think it's a good word for us. So I love what Jesus says here in verse 27. No one can enter the strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house. Jesus is using a parable to talk with them. And a parable is really just kind of like a proverbial story. It is a story with a doctrinal purpose. It is a heaven, it's an earthly story, some people say, with a heavenly truth. And so he's telling them that if there's a strong man who has a house full of goods, no one's gonna enter the strong man's house and plunder his home while he's there. And you know, it's actually a parable of Satan. Satan is the strong man. And the goods, his goods are the people that he has captive. But what Jesus is telling them through this parable is I'm the one who binds Satan and plunders his house. I'm the one who's stronger than the strong man. That's what the parable says. No one can enter the strong man's house and plunder his good unless he first binds the strong man. Guys, that's the work of Jesus. He's plundering the kingdom of Satan. Isn't that exciting? Christians are like Vikings. Here we are. We're on Jesus's raiding party. You know, I was so inspired as I was studying this text and some of the older theologians who really view the world as enemy territory. I know we, we have a very millennial mindset in our church. Where we, we believe Jesus is gonna come here and set up his kingdom on earth and he's gonna rule and reign. But the reality is, is until then, there's a fight on this world. And that fight is for the destiny of man's eternal destination. Where are people gonna end up? There's a war for people's souls going on all around us. And Jesus is binding the strong man. He's binding Satan. I love jujitsu. I do jujitsu. And I just imagine Jesus has got Satan to the mat. You know, his arm twisted behind his back and he's holding him down and he's plundering the house of Satan. And you and I are called to be a part of that. We are the emissaries of Christ in this world. We are his ambassador, ambassadors, his messengers, his soldiers, Paul would write. And you and I are called to be proactive with the gospel, to see people get saved. And I love what John Corson says about this passage, that there's a clear word that you and I need to pray. If it's Jesus who binds the strong man, then the first thing you and I should do is pray that Jesus binds him. You know what John Corson would say, if you're just trying your hardest and nothing's happening, it's probably because you haven't prayed. It's Jesus who binds the strong man. And guys, you know, every Wednesday night, this summer, we're doing a corporate prayer meeting and the last two prayer nights have just been so powerful. 6.30 to 7.30, we only pray for an hour. We're not gonna keep you there all night. But it's been so powerful as we've been praying as a church and God has been speaking to us and people have had have, have, have words that, you know, th this area is like dry, broken, cracked ground and the flowers are wilting or just praying for the water of God to be poured out on us again. We're praying that God brings his light to this dark city 
I don't know if you guys are aware of how dark Ashland is. We get used to it because we live here. But I can tell you those two pastors that came up from Corvallis last week, they both texted me later and said, hey, make sure you're praying. Because one of them said, I could feel the spiritual darkness in that town. I remember when I was coming here and I told some people I was interviewing at this church, some of the first words out of their mouth is, oh, you're going to Ashland? That place is very dark. It's very dark. And yet right here, Jesus is saying, I'm the one who's stronger than Satan. And you and I need to pray in faith and say, Jesus, bind the enemy. Lord, we're just asking for your power to be poured out in Ashland, your presence to come to this town. We're asking you to set captives free and we'll get behind the Lord and let him push back the darkness. I'm ready to see people get saved. How about you guys? Guys, I believe the Lord wants to do something good again. I have to believe it. I was talking with our elders and I said, do you sense the Lord getting ready to move again? And this elder said, yes, I do. And I think for you and I, it starts with prayer. Starts with prayer. So 6.30 Wednesday nights, if you can make it, come join us. If you can't make it, I'd encourage you in your private time, be praying. Be praying for our church. Be praying for our city that God just opens doors for people to get saved. Well, let's go on to the unpardonable sin. Let's see how much time I have left. I have two minutes. <laughs> oh no, I have to teach this message twice now. Well, you know what? I made a promise, so let's bring the worship team up. <laughs> Come on up, guys. And... uh We'll tackle the unpardonable sin next week. And this week you can all just sweat it. No, I'm just kidding. Um, this is what I will say. Let's just read over it real briefly because I know probably a lot of you were just worked up like I'm so ready for this, okay? I feel worked up too. This is what Jesus said. Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men and whatever blasphemies they may utter. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation because they said he has an unclean spirit. Guys, I just want to put your hearts at ease this morning. Look at the first thing Jesus said in 28. People totally miss that when they read this passage. Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven, the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they may utter. And we'll talk about it more next week, but what you come to learn when you study this is the blaspheme of the Holy Spirit isn't so much an action as it is a heart posture. Jesus was warning these Pharisees because they looked at the good work of God, what he was doing. They said, that must be the work of Satan. And Jesus said, be careful. Because to reject the convicting presence and power of the spirit is to be close to eternally condemning yourself because how can you be saved apart from Christ? There will be those who get to heaven who have rejected and rejected and they hardened their heart like Pharaoh to the point where they got what they wanted and that is unforgivable because when they stand before God, it's not because of the sin they committed, but the one they've rejected. They've looked at Jesus, they've heard about Jesus, they've seen the work of the Spirit and they say, it's not true, it's not true, it's not true and they just reject him. And the short thing is, is if, if you're scared this morning, you're not a believer, and you're like, hey, look, I don't want to blast me of the Spirit. I don't want to be eternally condemned. The answer is, is you need to surrender to Jesus because that's the work of the Spirit to reveal God's Son, Jesus Christ.